Welcome to another edition of CHP Talks. We are here today with Debbie Duvall and Hannah Kepka from Campaign Life Coalition Ottawa, and we are going to be talking today about Bill C-233 and other matters uh, relating to pro-life activity. So uh, with that, Rod, do you want to uh, give our guests a warm welcome? Well, it's so great to have the two of you here with us today uh, as our guests. We were your guests a couple of weeks ago uh, at the March for Life in Ottawa, which you both helped organize. And uh, it was a great event. We were so good to be there with you and see all those people come out. We didn't know what to expect. But we'll talk more about that in the uh, time that we have together. Uh, but I want to introduce you. Uh, Debbie Duvall is the National Capital Organizer for Campaign Life Coalition in their Ottawa office. She and her husband have been married 26 years and have three boys. As her children were growing up, Debbie helped run Bible camps and youth groups, and she also served on the Parent Council. She has served with CLC, Campaign Life Coalition, for seven years and helps organize the National March for Life. And by the way, do a great job. Uh, and she helps with 40 Days for Life, a life chain, helps pro-life candidates, works to educate the public about abortion and about euthanasia, and she's always praying for souls. Hannah Kepka has been government relations for Campaign Life Coalition for the last three years. Uh, she spent most of her life in Canada, but was born and spent her childhood in Poland and was privileged to witness the rise of the solidarity movement there, something that we should be paying attention to uh, in Canada. We, we need solidarity today. Uh, over the years, she's worn several hats, a ski instructor, archaeologist, museum specialist in various capacities, information manager, and now, she says, by the grace of God, pro-life researcher, activist, and lobbyist. She's been a catechist, a Catholic Girl Guides leader, and a school council member. Uh, in 2017, Hannah and Debbie met at a Polish demonstration in support of our pro-life hero, Mary Wagner. Since then, Hannah has spent more time following parliamentary debates regarding various bills of interest to the pro-life, pro-family movement, bills like C-7, the expansion of access to euthanasia, C-233, rather, ban on sex-selective abortion, and C-268, protection of conscience rights, and C-10, internet censorship. So we hope to talk about some of those things this morning. Uh, ladies, it's a real privilege to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us. Well, it's very nice that uh, you are inviting us to join you. It was awesome to see you both at the march, and uh, it's really nice to be with you today as well. Yeah, thanks. Well, yes, definitely. Being at the at the march uh, was a highlight for us. I don't think either of us had traveled a whole lot in, in many months and hadn't seen so many of you and others and, you know, Jeff Gunnerson and um, so many, um, you know, Kevin Dunn and the others who were there um, broadcasting the event. It was so good. Um, and uh, thanks so much. Um, one of the things I'll, I'll just mention this briefly um, was when I was talking to people afterwards, they said, you know, how was, you know, how was the police presence? You know, were they breaking the assembly apart? Were they, um, you know, they, there was, that was the suspicion. That was the expectation that they were saying, thinking that there'd been arrests. And I think that you said, Debbie, that um, you had a great relationship with the police that had been built up over many years. And in fact, um, it was a very well-organized, well-run, peaceful um, march. And there were no, um, conflicts at all with the police so thanks so much yeah, um, yeah that's very true we've, we've really built up a great relationship uh here in ottawa chris morosky and uh we've all worked with them for a long time and we start meeting with them we usually have a debrief and then we meet with them early in the season and just to get the lay of the land and um permits were not issued this year due to the the current situation but we still had our a right to, to demonstrate. We still always have a right to demonstrate. And I think they all know the law, they do, and the parliamentary uh, services as well. And they know us because for many years, they've we've worked with them, we've had to turn the march around and they know who we are. They know that we're law abiding and want peaceful march, but we do want our issue out there. So they did their job and uh, and we're very we're very grateful for the, for the way they work with us and, and have for years. That was awesome. Yeah, they, that little uh, 
That might actually be just if you can briefly tell that story to listeners about how the march was turned around that one year. Uh, it was so it was so interesting to be part of that march. Um, that and it was so creative. The solution that the police had come up with. Yeah, it's it's um, when we had that one really bad year with a lot of those groups after us. Um, the big thing and what the police always say is they want a safe march. And of course we do too. So what happened was we were all lined up and we knew that was the plan. Only very few people knew though, is that we were going to decide once we were on the street, what to do. And so Chris knew, and, and we all knew that we were either going to go backwards or down the middle. And that's what ended up happening. And they, we all had walkie talkies and that's what happened. So then you're like yelling, turn around, you know, everyone go the other way. And I think some people were upset. I think people really wanted to just march, them, mow them down. But, you know, that's not who we are. That's not who we are. And uh, I think that uh, it was a successful march. And I think that all of our people were very happy to at least continue to march despite the, uh, the um, other side after us, you know. Yeah, the word was spreading through the crowd and it was sort of like we were part of this great um, secret that everybody was suddenly trick. going to, you know, turn around and it was so interesting to be part of that march, but it mm -hmm. shows the real relationship that you have and uh, anyways, I just thought it would be fun to share that. Yeah, uh, yeah. I wish it were as easy to turn our country around as, as to oh. turn the... Uh, the pro-life marchers around our country is going in such a terrible direction. Uh, it was great this year at on the Hill, uh, how many people came out. I, I think you didn't know for sure how many would, would show up under the circumstances. We had no idea. As, as you know, I drove across the country to uh, be there with you, uh, and it was a real treat to be there. It was special. Do you have any idea, the, you know, final numbers? Uh, like I've heard estimates from... 500 to 700, do you, do you have a more accurate number there? We don't really, but um, I remember before we left here, we we're bringing signs and I'm like, oh, because my first guess was 500. And then it, as, as it got closer, I, I was chickening out, you know, less people, less people. And what we did with the police was, I, I said to her, like we, we called a couple of days before and I said, I'm gonna tell you there's over a hundred. I have no basis for that information. It could just be the 12 of us, you know, we have no idea, but I'm gonna just say a hundred. And I think I've heard 750 to a thousand. I would say it's probably around 750 or 800. And I was shocked because like every March on the Hill, it doesn't look like very many people, but then people come specifically to March. They don't come for the rally. So the street got very crowded and, and that was great. And, and the police along the way said, oh yeah, this is way more than you know what I thought on the Hill was like 300. So that was, that was very neat. And, and um, Margie Mountain, who was the co-chair of the March for Life and has been a pro-lifer in this area forever. She said that the very first March 25 years ago had 800 people so it's almost like the grassroots has started again it's almost like it's a reboot and i was very heartened by that yeah. you know and i was very heartened by the the march too because it seemed those who wanted to be there were there those who wanted to speak and were truly pro truly pro-life pro-family they spoke they were there they were truly there so it was very good for my heart and a lot of people said the same thing yeah Absolutely. Well, Hannah, your job description is uh, government uh, relations with Campaign Life Coalition, and uh, we want to talk a little bit about that for sure. Um, do you want to start our, our uh, maybe our main topic for the day with uh, Bill C-233 and maybe give us a little bit of uh, background? If there's anyone who's listening who doesn't know what it's about, could you maybe explain it? Well, this bill was introduced by Kathy Wagenthal. Uh, an MP from Saskatchewan. Uh, the bill is a, was proposing to introduce a ban on sex selective abortion in Canada. Uh, many are surprised to hear that this is a phenomenon that does happen in Canada, but according to um, medical uh, reports, it does. And the number that I have, uh, that I remember is about 2000, uh, mostly girls are concerned uh, by, by this phenomenon, that, that would mean that about 2,000 girls uh, are killed every year because uh, their families would prefer to have boys rather than girls. 
So it's a phenomenon that touches women in a particular way. Uh, the bill was introduced as a bill addressing inequality between men and women. Uh, it was uh, identified by the opponents of the bill as a roundabout way to uh, criminalize uh, at least abortions in, in certain cases. Uh, and indeed, Kathy Wagenthal is a pro-life MP. Uh, this is the second bill that she's introducing. It was a private member's bill. Uh, she has introduced uh, previously a bill called, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, wasn't Kathy's and, uh, do you remember? Uh, no, uh, Molly's and uh, Cassie's. Cassie's Cass and Molly's. Yeah, Cassie and Molly's. Sorry, Cassie Cassie and Cassie. Cassie. <laughs> Cassie's and Molly's law. Uh, so the previous bill she introduced uh, was um, uh, aiming at uh, um, considering pre-born children killed in a criminal act as victims as well, recognize their existence. Currently, if a pre-born baby is killed while its mother is being attacked, that baby is completely ignored by, um, uh, by, by Canadian criminal law. It's not a victim, it doesn't exist. So Kathy Wagenthal uh, was in a remarkable position uh, since she was elected first time in 2015 to be an MP for, for her writing, to have had the chance already to introduce two pro-life bills. So we're very, very grateful to her for that. Um, she's uh, obviously a very uh, courageous and, uh, and resourceful uh, individual to be able to present these two these two remarkable bills. These ideas have been presented in Canadian Parliament previously, um, but haven't passed. Right? So she was reintroducing these ideas in a slightly new form. Uh, now, what happened last week is that Bill C two thirty three, ban on sex selective abortion, was read for the uh, or was reached at the end of debate on second reading in Parliament, and a vote uh, was taken. Uh, which would have allowed this bill, if, if the vote was positive, if there were more yeas than nays, the bill would, would be sent to committee for further discussion and submissions from the Canadian public. Um, now, on the nay, that this is, this is the end of the bill's uh, progress through Parliament. And so, unfortunately, the overall uh, vote was a negative one. Uh, two, uh, so, sorry, three quarters of our parliament voted against that bill. Uh, now two thirds of the conservative party voted in favor of that bill. And so uh, I don't know if you'd like me to, to share with you now some observations regarding these proportions, but I think that um, the results of this vote in our parliament uh, are very telling as to the relationship of our political elites uh, to the grassroots. Yes, please do share some of these insights that, that will be uh, telling and um, probably may help uh, some of our members or some of our listeners who aren't yet members even to um, get more involved and possibly consider running in an area where an MP has been a, a complete disappointment on this, on this issue. That's right, plenty of opportunity <laughs> now, right? So there are three sort of key numbers that I think are, are significant when we look at um, uh, what this bill tells us, or the vote on this bill tells us about the relationship between uh, grassroots uh, Canadian voters and our political elites. According to an opinion poll that Cathy Wagenthal was quoting in her presentation uh, uh, and justification for why to introduce such a bill, 84% of Canadians, regardless of their political affiliation, uh, are in favor of criminalizing sex selective abortion whether it concerns boys or girls, pre-born boys or girls, uh, most Canadians consider that this is an absolutely, absolutely uh, unacceptable uh, practice and, and should be criminalized. Now, three quarters of our federal parliament voted in favor of uh, maintaining this practice, voted against criminalizing this practice. So to me, that indicates very clearly that the majority of our um, federal parliamentarians are in a disconnect with uh, grassroots Canadians. So yes, plenty of opportunity to present new candidates 
in all these writings. Uh, I won't be going through the list, of course, because we have 337 parliamentarians right now, but all this information can be found on, on, the, uh, on the parliamentary webpage, of course, in the Hansard. Um, now, as far as the Conservative Party goes, two thirds of those MPs, two thirds of the, of the Conservative caucus, in favor of sex slave abortion. Now, the leader of the party did not. He voted with one third that opposed the bill. Now, isn't that an interesting situation as well? No. As, so as, I, think that, no. I think that based on these statistics, there is good reason to have a federal election <laughs> and also have a leadership review yeah. in the Conservative yeah. Party. Yeah, uh, as did, unfortunately, uh, Pierre Polyev, who's, uh, you know, kind of one of the other bright lights in the Conservative Party, um, bright lights, for, depending on who you are. Uh, but what I noted in my communique this week uh, regarding that vote is that 31 of the 81 Conservatives who voted uh, in favor of the bill previously voted in uh, for either Mr. O'Toole or Mr. McKay in the leadership contest. So, you know, it's nice that they voted for this bill, you know, uh, kudos to them for that. But uh, they're, you know, in my view, if they helped Mr. O'Toole become the leader of the Conservative Party and they knew he was pro-choice at the time, they're either uh, internally conflicted or confused because um, if they would have supported one of the pro-life uh, leadership contestants, uh, they might be in a much better situation if they really care about this issue and i'm sure some of them do but um, for whatever strange reason they voted for a, a pro-abortion leader for their own party um, I, I think that's the uh, you know the sort of sense of uh, pragmatism there that uh, ends up <laughs> it, it goes downhill from there i think so anyway thanks to everyone who voted for it and we certainly uh, love and appreciate Kathy Wagenthal for using her, uh, you know, position, her responsibility, her opportunity to bring a bill forward. She didn't shy away from this issue, which is kind of the elephant in the room. She went right for it. And now twice, as you pointed out uh, in her career, mm -hmm. she's brought forward pro-life uh, legislation. So kudos to her. Well, I think there is also one interesting element that um, is to a large extent re related to the rhetoric that is being used in our, in our, uh, uh, on our political scene now. Uh, we hear feminist feminism declined in every possible way, yeah. especially from all of these parties and these MPs who voted against this very bill. Now, this bill was presented as a feminist bill yeah. because although in the bill itself, it wasn't specified that the ban would be on aborting girls. It was a ban on sex selective abortion that yes, does concern boys and girls, but girls in an absolutely uh, predominant proportion. So the idea was, well, if we are all so feminist, all of us here MPs in this parliament, we surely will be against aborting girls, killing girls, let's, let's be frank only because there are girls, yeah. right? And yet, and yet all of the people who use feminism most in their speeches and who present themselves as feminist the most were the most outraged and opposed to this bill. I know, no, every, so every, every MP in the house should have been voting for that bill, even if they're pro, so-called pro-choice because uh, exactly what you just said. It it should have been uh, on everybody's radar that this is to protect uh, women. Um, Debbie, I, you've been involved with a pro-life movement around Ottawa for some time. Um, what is your sense of the temperature in Ottawa as far as the pro-life uh, sort of, you know, in your surrounding area, are people becoming more pro-life or less pro-life? Do you, do you have any sense of that? Wow. I think if you, I don't know if I have a sense of that. Yeah. I know some of my closer circles, of course, are, are pro-life. Uh, some have stepped up. We've had several calls here. Hannah, you've had some too from people who 
would normally not vote our way or think our way, and they seem to be coming out of the woodwork. This is new. People that were, and Hannah had a very interesting call yesterday as well. People who normally would not have uh, thought the way we we're thinking are turning around. And I think because of the political climate and because of how far, far, far left things have gone. Right. And um, but from from people who are okay to vote for uh, O'Toole, for example, who came out and said, I am pro-choice. And so these people are now seem to be shocked that he's not pro-life. I'm not understanding, and you're right, there's a huge disconnect, or voting for their, their MP or their MPP, and they're not doing good things for them now. And I think people maybe, maybe might be, bef might be seeing the connection. I'm hoping, but uh, I'm not finding people more pro-life. And remember, we live here in this very, very political city. And I find smaller cities, even just working with the schools all those years, when I would deal with uh, school boards from outside of Ottawa, they were very, and I'll just talk about the Catholic system, they were very Jesus oriented and, and marchers for Jesus. And I'm like, what are you doing? We can't do anything like that here. So I'm thinking here is a little bit more polarized. I think we're just more not pro-life, more political, more politically correct than outside. That's sort of the feeling I get. Well, I think what you're saying often, maybe too, is that Ottawa is a civil servant city, right? And from my experience, I, I have friends who are definitely pro-life, but there is no way they will show their face to be photographed you know, and recorded anywhere. Uh, because they believe that they lose their, their um, uh, public service positions. That's very true. That's very true among several of my, my, the people I know as well. So self-censorship. Mm. So I think that in a way, the support for uh, the pro-life position is larger that we can often so see. so too, it. yeah. Uh, because like Debbie mentioned, the fellow I was speaking to yesterday, he didn't happen to be from Ottawa, but I think he, he illustrates that kind of a situation. Uh, second generation pro-lifer, at least, uh, with pro-life family, uh, but very much asked me not to publish his name uh, because he likes to work from, uh, from the shadows, from behind the scene. Uh, he doesn't want to be labeled as a pro-lifer, uh, supports several organizations. And that's probably the case here to a large extent as well. But we are so still on that most note, people. Sorry. So on that note, were there were there MPs that voted for Bill C two thirty three um, who you were surprised who voted for? Are there maybe a handful of names that you could say, "Wow, I did not think that they would have had the backbone, the courage to you know vote for it." Well, one comes to mind, and that's Raquel, Raquel Dancho. I guess that's how you pronounce it. I've heard different pronunciations of her first name. Um, but she is a young MP from out west, a young female MP, uh, who is paraded, I'm sorry to use this term, but in a way, yes, by the Conservative Party as the uh, young, uh, progressive uh, woman, poster girl, frankly, really, right? Uh, she participated in one of the debates during the convention and held very progressive, very pro-choice positions. So I think that she actually voted on the feminist, uh, along the feminist line, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I think that that uh, presentation of this bill spoke to many and some uh, dared to act on this, uh, uh, along this line. And I think that if the vote was a free vote in all the parties, we would have seen support from other parties as well, precisely because of the feminist take on, on this question. A good point. What other bills right now uh, are you watching or uh, maybe looking for um, in, the, uh, in the months ahead? Well, there are sort of two urgencies in Parliament right now. Uh, both bills are still in the House of Commons, but probably to go to the Senate soon. One is Bill C6, a ban on conversion therapy. And uh, that title is somewhat dismissive, uh, or I mean, um, somewhat uh, misleading, because what seems to be most dangerous in this bill is the criminalization 
of Christian teaching mm -hmm. on sexuality and human body. Mm -hmm. So it's not really the therapy that's addressed, but is the whole concept of human sexuality, its purpose, uh, and so on. So that's one bill definitely to watch. Uh, we don't know when the vote will be happening, but the vote on third reading, so kind of the final vote mm. before the bill goes to Senate, may be happening any time now. I have been told it won't be happening today, but it might happen tomorrow or in the following days. Uh, it's very difficult to know when this is happening because uh, it's a government bill and the government doesn't share this information readily much ahead of time. So uh, I'm, I'm staying in touch with uh, my contacts as much as I can to get this information as soon as it's available at all. Uh, but that's what I can say, that it's not going to be voted to, on today and uh, possibly not the rest of this week, but maybe next week. Uh, now, the other bill is C-10, and that's the Internet Censorship Bill. And the government is extremely um, eager to have this bill pass to the point that a motion was voted on, um, when, when was it, two days ago or so? I think so. Uh, in Parliament, a motion that passed to uh, impose a cap on the length of remaining discussion in committee uh, many discussions have taken place already. They had uh, 25 meetings, I think, which is a considerable mm -hmm. number, but it's a very, very consequential bill. And so uh, a cap of five more hours has been imposed on further discussion. So whether all the amendments will have been discussed or not, that bill will come back to the House of Commons for, for a vote. Uh, to be sent to the Senate. And the Senate can unfortunately uh, do its work very quickly on it because they have already started studying this issue uh, beforehand. And they also started studying the issue concerned by Bill C6, ban on, on conversion therapy. Because in fact, that question was introduced in the Senate first, uh, already several months ago, uh, through a bill uh, that was not carried through uh, because of the prorogation of parliament. Uh, but but the Senate has already been working on both of these questions and may be very ready to uh, to vote on on the bills quickly and and send the bills to royal dissent, unfortunately. And the third bill that uh, merits our attention uh, with less urgency at this point is uh, Bill uh, C two sixty eight, uh, the protection of conscience rights of medical practitioners or med medical staff, I think in general. A uh, bill presented by Kelly Block, uh, another private member's bill. Um, now, this bill is supposed to be read uh, for the first time on uh, second reading uh, on the very last day of Parliament, the 23rd of June, before the Parliament left for, uh, for the summer. Which means that the Parliament can actually uh, end its sitting earlier in the week in the day, so it is not certain that that reading will take place. Uh, now, if we do not have an election soon, this bill will come back uh, in the fall uh, mm -hmm. for further readings and, and hopefully a vote and, and maybe beyond. So this is something to watch, watch out for and uh, communicate on this summer as well. Yeah, I want to talk briefly about Bill C-6, just in terms of if, if you're not familiar with it, if, if listeners aren't familiar with it, one of the things that's probably the most troubling about it is that it, it's a one-way street. Um, if someone wants to convert their gender from their gender uh, at birth to something else, um, that's fine, go right ahead. If you want to, um, if you realize your mistake at some point and want to, um, have help, um, counseling, um, therapy to um, come back to your gender at birth. That's where the problem lies, especially with anyone who's trying to help you. Um, it's, it's been said before, and we've talked about these things on previous editions of CHP Talks, but um, just want to make sure that that's out there. Um, and uh, yeah, if you want to comment on that further, but uh, otherwise we can talk about the other bills as well. Well, there was something very interesting, interesting comment from an NDP MP that I came across uh, again about two days ago when the bill was discussed in Parliament. Uh, the eternal question about this bill is, well, what about private conversations? Would these be censored too? 
And of course, the proponents of the bill say, oh, no, absolutely not. However, in this one response, the uh, NDP MP said, well, actually, our opinion on this may, may differ when he was answering a conservative MP's questioning on the issue. And um, where does the boundary lie between uh, conversion therapy and private conversation may not be quite so clear as far as uh, conversations between parents and children or pastors and their faithful are concerned. Perhaps the courts will have to decide. Really? <laughs> you know, so whatever they were um, uh, claiming is absolutely not the case. There is no danger whatsoever. Well, the cat came out of the box. Yeah. Well, there is danger, yes. And anybody who was warning the rest of us against that was clearly right. And, and the proponents of the bill are very conscious of, the fa of this fact. And, you know, the more discussions happen, the more truth uh, ends up coming, I don't know, by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and uh, yes, it is, a, it is a very dangerous bill. Um, even, even the lawyer I was talking to yesterday said, well, how can you enforce such a thing? Like, who, who decides? Um, but because it is so vague and so open, uh, unfortunately, the partisan course that we have can decide a variety of uh, very destructive things. Yes, the, the vagueness of the bill is, is a major problem. It's, it doesn't help at all. And it gives so much leeway to the courts who are so often not on the right side of these issues. Well, in fact, what even many of the cr uh, critics of the bill say, this fact alone should make this bill uh, uneligible mm -hmm. for passing because criminal code must be precise. You cannot outlaw something that is ill-defined. So there are many problems. Well said. Yeah. Well said. Um, so then moving on to Bill C-10, what is what is your concern, especially with um, in terms of pro-life work with this bill? Well, it's a internet censorship bill, right? So any potential form of censorship that one can think of is a concern uh, in this case. Uh, one of the questions that was asked in Parliament once again was, for example, um, what about algorithms? Will this bill affect the algorithms that, that uh, um, sort the sort of information that either makes it to the top or is available at all? Well, no answer was given, which suggests that yes, <laughs> somebody didn't want to lie and refused to say no, right? Uh, so yeah, many of us believe that, and, and lawyers who have been uh, looking at this bill, that unfortunately any form of censorship of information on uh, on the internet will be available to the government. So it's a totalitarian situation. That's uh, very troubling. Uh, so you uh, witnessed the rise of the solidarity movement in Poland. Uh, you know, we are you know, I think all of us feel that we're part of a movement uh, in Canada. It's probably not, we, we haven't got the unity and the numbers, active numbers, either in the pro-life movement or perhaps in the freedom movement that is uh, active now concerning about uh, the, the shutdown of, of uh, information. But that's one of the most troubling things I've been reading recently about World War II, uh, you know, the, the Nazi phenomenon, uh, uh, the tyrannical approach there. And then, of course, the uh, communist world where, you know, free speech was shut down. Uh, so, you know, that, that whole idea that people would not be able to present their ideas. Um, and, you know, the Internet is just one of the venues. We, we already feel it in the mass media. The internet was kind of a, a go around for us. Uh, it was a detour by which we could still reach the public, uh, you know, for a period of time. But if that is taken away, um, you know, we're going to have a very difficult time getting getting our message out. Uh, so, uh, you know, I just really appreciate what both of you are doing, uh, and uh, it, it has to be challenging, Debbie, to uh, just keep everything happening in the office there that that needs to happen i mean an organization like yours requires uh requires money it requires lots of volunteer labor um and uh, you had to keep the troops encouraged we know all that as a political party um 
you know, how, how has your experience been just managing your office and uh, keeping, keeping the pro-life movement? I, I sort of would take it you're the core of the pro-life movement in, in the Ottawa area. It's um, great to have the team we have. That's all I can say. I don't think you can do this alone. <laughs> I sure can't. Yeah. And uh, I found with this past year, we were out of the office for a little bit. Mostly we were back. But it's very hard to do this separated. And that's sort of, you know, Satan's work is to divide and uh, conquer. And I think a lot of that has happened. I think the march really... Um, invigorated a lot of people again i think the march well i do know i know uh several people that spoke there that said thank you for pushing me to come it's it's really i didn't really push but i encouraged yeah. uh, for them to come and they said it's really um empowered them again so they're outside in other areas you know whether they're attending freedom marches or anything but they're still really speaking about the pro-life causes you know euthanasia and abortion and um so that's the thing. I think we need to be together. I think there needs to be solidarity. And of course, our Toronto office, we're together with this. We have offices across the country. And uh, we get together every, every day at prayer time and we encourage each other. And that's really what we're supposed to be doing. Praying that God shows us the very next best step for us, you know, and that's what we do. Whether we win or lose, that's what we do, and uh, and that and that's how that's how we each of us each of us continue is it's uh, just through the grace of God because I don't know how else you would because you know we've had a couple of defeats yeah <laughs> it's a little bit tough and uh, and um, so that's that's what we do and and we keep going well we think, we uh, in the CHP and of course. Uh, generations to come of preborn who uh, preborn Canadians who are, have not yet arrived on the scene, and some who are not even yet conceived, and the elderly and the vulnerable uh, in our country. We give you thanks for what you're doing, a, a work of sacrifice, and you are making a difference. It was a, such a privilege for us to be there with you uh, this year, and so. We want you to keep up the good work that you've been doing all these years. I don't know, Peter, if you had a still a, a final question before we uh, come to, the, unfortunately, the end of this segment. Oh, you're muted. I think we are at a point where we uh, uh, have um, wrapped up as well as we can with that encouragement to pray, that encouragement that you receive uh, every day from your prayer times. And um, I hope that uh, you're praying for us in the pro-life movement and yes. we should do likewise. But um, that's maybe where we'll leave it with our audience. Keep track of these important bills that we've talked about today and uh, keep praying for um, the members of parliament who have courage and for those that don't, that they would um, receive God's grace as well. And uh, with that, thank you all for listening. And we hope you'll join us next time for another edition of CHP Talks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having us.